Welcome to Conservation Conversations, the podcast where we discuss emerging technologies, global trends, and the future of biodiversity conservation with some of the world's leading experts. I'm your host, Sean O'Brien, President and CEO of NatureServe, where we've been working for 50 years to protect endangered species and ecosystems. Before I introduce you to our first guest, let me tell you a little bit more about who we are and why we started this podcast. NatureServe is a global leader in the use of science, data, and technology for conserving biodiversity and preventing extinction. With this podcast, we want to introduce our audience to some of today's key players in conservation and share the amazing work being done around the globe to protect our planet's rich biodiversity. Today, in our very first Conservation Conversation podcast, we'll be starting at the beginning of the modern history of biodiversity with Dr. Thomas Lovejoy. Tom is often referred to as the godfather of biodiversity and is one of the most important figures and a thought leader in modern biodiversity conservation. Tom is also a senior fellow at the United Nations Foundation and a professor of environmental science and policy at George Mason University. With that, let's get into it. Well, I'm here today with Tom Lovejoy from the UN Foundation and the person who is credited as being the father of biodiversity as we think of it today and we think of that term. And uh, Tom, I just wanted to start off by asking you, like, what attracted you to studying biology? Like, was there some inspirational moment or some event that caused you to want to be a biologist? Well, there was, but first let me straighten one thing out. Uh, somebody wants, introduced me as the father of biodiversity before a talk. And I said, no, 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 that's not biologically possible, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so they came up Fair with point. the idea of godfather. I did notice on Wikipedia, it says godfather. And uh, I thought that sounded a little more ominous. So <laughs> I, I, I went with father. <laughs> well, in any case, so, um, so I was always, uh, when I had the opportunity outdoors um, and was really interested in animals. Um, and when I was looking for a school to go to in 1955, the first one that we visited was the Millbrook School, which has a zoo. And that's all I needed to hear, right? Right. Um, and I said, this is where I want to go. And luckily I got in. Well, it turns out, I mean, I had no idea about science. I had no idea about biodiversity or the variety of life on earth. Um, the biology teacher, his name was Frank Trevor, who had created the zoo. And he also taught biology. And you had to take it the first or second year. And I said, you know, with, with great wisdom, I said, I'll take it the first year and get it over with. And here I am. Right. right. So basically in three weeks, he flipped my switch. And March, me and the other students through the plant kingdom and then through the animal kingdom. So by the time I wasn't even 15, I understood the outline of life on Earth, mm. or what today we would call biological diversity. And Isn't it interesting how many people's story includes an inspirational teacher? Well, it's so true. And uh, this, this guy did it for many people. And the, the zoo still exists, and the students help take care of the animals, and they breed endangered species, and they're accredited by the AAZA. And, um, it's a great place. Yeah, that's great. So you were um, obviously interested in the 50s and then went to college in the 60s and did field work in the 60s. And one of the things that I think about, because I started doing field work in the late 80s, and even then you could get yourself into a situation where there wasn't a lot of opportunity for assistance, whereas today, you can use a cell phone or a satellite phone pretty much anywhere on the planet. And if something goes wrong, there's help can be on its way. I'd love to hear some story about when you were first getting started and going out in the field. What was it like back then? Because I think in many ways, it wasn't that much different than what Darwin experienced more than 100 years earlier. Well, you know, it, it wasn't scary. Um, 
we didn't even know about the options that were coming, right? Right. Um, and so you just, you know, try to do sensible things and uh, not fall into quicksand and stuff like that. Um, and, um, you know, it just was sensible to the extent that you always had somebody who knew where you were were or were going or what you were trying to do. So if you were late or something, they'd go chase after you. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really pretty magical. So I, I would actually, had, I had dreams of doing my PhD on montane forest birds in East Africa. I was besotted with East Africa. And my freshman advisor, who by that point was at the Smithsonian, came back to New Haven on a brief visit in my first year in graduate school. He said, if I wrote a letter to a person at the Rockefeller Foundation, I could probably get the funding to spend the summer with them in the Amazon. And that's how it started. And at that point, the Amazon was essentially 97% intact. Right. And imagine right. that. Right? An area as big as the 48 states and 97% intact. Uh, and of course, it was just brimming with all kinds of biological diversity, a lot of it undescribed. And um, I never looked back. It was like, you know, it was like, as I'd like to say, it was like being in a biologist equivalent of a Christmas stocking with no end to it. <laughs> yeah, and it is remarkable to think about 97% intact and just how much has been lost that we don't know we have lost because it was never cataloged. True. Sure. And that, that is really terrifying. We just don't know what's out there. Um, so that's, that is, of course, one of the things that we're trying to do now at NatureServe is catalog uh, the biodiversity of at least the Americas, which is our primary service area. Uh, but even that, even just in North America, that's very difficult because we constantly discover new species, um, even, even here in the United States. And um, then finding someone who can actually do research on them and discover what, they, what their life story is, is very challenging. That's right, and there are these huge sort of knowledge frontiers like soil biodiversity, right? Yeah. Totally essential to how everything else works, um, but mostly sort of overlooked and forgotten. Um, and when you think about the prairie soil systems and the root systems of those grasses, which went down 12, 14 feet, uh, accumulating just immense stores of carbon, which John Deere's plow, of course, made available for a fairly wasteful form of agriculture that we practiced. We lost a lot of that soil carbon. <clears throat> um, and, you know, when you get beyond the vertebrates uh, and maybe well known gro groups like butterflies or or something like that, uh, there is just so much still to be discovered. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm, one of the things that we're thinking about now a lot is how technology, which is changing so quickly, as we talked about a little bit before, just that was just in terms of communication, but now we think about uh, remote sensing, whether from shoebox satellites or other kinds of satellites, from drones, uh, LIDAR surveys, the kinds of things that we can do with remote chemical sensing. Um, just the frontiers for biology uh, and understanding the planet are sort of hard to comprehend, especially... Well, you know, it is amazing. I mean, most of those things you were describing didn't exist when I was a graduate student. <clears throat> the whole sort of approach of telemetry getting a little gadget on an organism that will tell you where it's flying to or going to. Uh, it only just started 
and they were big, heavy, clumsy things, couldn't do much with it. Mm -hmm. And you know, now the National Geographic is on the verge of announcing 10 meters square remote sensing data for free for the entire world, updated with artificial intelligence annually. I mean, imagine what that will do to change things. It's I was astonishing. Just talking yesterday with somebody who's, who I think will do it. It's, it's got a serious plan to, to do LIDAR for the entire terrestrial world. And happily, it's going to start in the Amazon. Oh, that'll be amazing because partly we will learn a lot about the biology of the Amazon, but we'll also learn a lot about the human impacts on the Amazon from prehistory, which would be fascinating. That's right. He, he was the guy who did that uh, city of the monkey god in Honduras. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met him just as he had sort of figured out that there had to be Mayan ruins under that forest. It's really cool what they can do. Yeah, it really is. Uh, so I wanted to ask you a little bit actually about the UN Foundation and the work that you do there. and. Um, what the foundation is doing related to the pandemic and other issues that are facing the planet today outside of conservation specifically. Sure, well, the UN Foundation, uh, as you know, was started by Ted Turner. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of his money has already been spent. That was what he stipulated, that it be spent. So uh, it's been, been very successful in raising other money and helping in the kinds of things the UN is engaged in, but it can't do it all. Uh, there's always been a climate and energy element in what in their agenda. And our CEO, Elizabeth Cousins, was actually our number two in our mission to the UN in New York uh, and personally negotiated for the United States on the sustainable development goals. So Elizabeth does not need a lot of education about the important <laughs> that you and I care about. Right. And she's actually been with her husband and son to my camp in the Amazon a few years ago. Uh, and so one of the really important things to keep an eye on <clears throat> is, is how the whole process of renegotiating the sustainable development goals actually works out. Uh, most people in the United States don't even know about them, uh, but most other countries take them seriously. And there's 17, three of which are just totally obviously environmental. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would have to say, of the 17, those three are lagging behind the most. Made some progress, but that needs to be fixed because otherwise the other 14 won't be sustainable. Right. We have a uh, program at NatureServe called the Indicators Project where we do uh, automated tracking of biodiversity indicators. And a lot of that is around the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, and of course the three sustainable development goals that you're just referencing. And we're trying to work with uh, country governments to help them uh, be able to uh, report against those goals in a more effective way for exactly the reason you're talking about, so that we don't lag behind on the biodiversity goals compared to some of the other goals. And uh, it's, it's very challenging, but uh, very important work. And of course, as you know, these things are in the, in the process of being renegotiated and made, made more complicated by the travel restrictions, but um, hard to imagine any, uh, from our perspective, anything more important being negotiated in the next year or so. Well, that's very true. So, you know, what people mostly are unaware of is that anything we call an environmental problem we call it that because it affects living systems, which means that biodiversity integrates all the environmental problems. Uh, so trying to 
do something for biodiversity means you have to address all of them, not just the things that affect biodiversity directly, like a bulldozer, <laughs> but uh, acid rain or whatever it might be. So there is no better measure of the sustainability of the planet than the state of its biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So that actually is a great segue into something that I've been thinking about a lot right now, which is we have these major issues on the planet right now, whether it's the, the pandemic or Black Lives Matter movement and all of the issues related to social justice there that are just so important to get right. And at the same time, in the background, we have these constant threats with climate change and extinctions. And how can we make progress on those while also, uh, you know, keep attention on those while also focusing on these issues while we have a chance to make a difference with, with issues related to racial justice um, and, of course, saving people's lives in the pandemic? So they really are part and parcel of the same thing. So if you think about the trajectory of environmental problems going forward, we're basically talking about what could potentially be the greatest environmental justice issue of all time. Because of a degraded planet, we would be leaving uh, future generations. Uh, so it's, it's incredibly important to sort of have that perspective, realize, you know, that there are large segments of populations in many countries that are hugely disadvantaged. Uh, and in contrast, you know, uh, Pavan Sukhdev once did a really interesting analysis of what he called the GDP of the poor. Mm -hmm. And Amazonian indigenous peoples actually had very high GDP. And it just all came from nature. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to think about it in that larger context, both immediately and the longer term, is essential if we're going to be successful. Yeah. And so many people um, who are disadvantaged in the classic sense of GDP are in areas that are gonna be disproportionately affected by uh, say higher temperatures where parts of the planet may be essentially uninhabitable because of higher temperatures and the degradation of ecosystem services or nature services to mankind as those mm -hmm. fall apart, it's gonna be a, a, a huge challenge for uh, so many people. Very true. Yeah, I, I worry a lot about that and um, making sure that we're focusing on those justice issues uh, in the environmental movement. Uh, you know, one of the things we talk about here, uh, because our focus is on threatened and endangered species, is this idea of extinction and the so-called sixth extinction. And I'm just curious, your like personal view, do you think the idea of calling it the sixth extinction resonates with people? Does it mean anything to people or is it just, is it confusing or does it, does it work as a message? So, so my, my fellow academics get into long twisted debates about that question. Right? Yeah. Um, I don't think there's any question, but we're at the beginning of it, right? Uh, which doesn't mean that all the rest of it will inevitably follow. Mm -hmm. um, now, I did the first projection of extinction rates in 1980 for the Global 2000 report for the president. And I've often been criticized as having predicted the numbers in that report, uh, and then they didn't happen. Well, that's not the point. You do a projection in the hopes that it will change yeah. the course of that. Right. And, and so there was a lot of progress made, um, but it's just been insufficient. And, you know, you put that together with there being three times as many people alive in the world today as when I was born. And what it will take to give them an adequate quality of life and feed them appropriately 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's a big challenge. It's not impossible, but if we keep going this old conventional ways, we'll make a mess out of it. That is true. Well, Tom, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I do want to see if you have any or things that have been that you've been thinking about and percolating that you think are important that you want to uh, preview for for our listeners uh, and an audience about you know what is Tom Lovejoy thinking right now? Well, there are two things I want to flag. One is uh, one is climate change. Um, it is essentially a biological issue, right? Uh, all the fossil fuels are ancient ecosystems. Um, and there's also a huge amount of carbon in the atmosphere from destruction of modern day ones. And we're already headed towards levels of climate change, which will be really hard on life on Earth. Mm -hmm. With the wonderful possibility, if we wake up, uh, that some really at scale ecosystem restoration could actually pull a major amount of that carbon back and allow us to, to get to a soft landing at one and a half degrees. So don't ever let anybody tell you that two degrees is okay. Uh, because I have you know, been studying biodiversity and climate change for 30 years and beyond one and a half degrees, the planet becomes biologically unmanageable. Uh, ecosystems start to come apart. So let's, let's recognize the planet works as a link biological and physical system, manage it that way and embrace what nature can do for us. But the other point I just wanted to flag uh, is the pandemic. And while I was building a reputation for studying birds in the Amazon in graduate school. I was also studying the antibodies those birds carried to arthropod-borne viruses like Venezuelan encephalitis. Mm. So I know sort of firsthand that it's the natural state of things for pathogens to be circulating in natural systems. And the challenge before us is how to manage our relationship with the natural systems of the earth and all that they can promise us uh, in ways that lower the probability of pandemics. And we certainly did it to ourselves this time through the way we've been destroying nature and penetrating nature and trading wildlife and having wildlife markets. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's so interesting. I've been reading a lot of epidemiology recently. And all the people who study that who don't come from the biodiversity background like me uh, all agree with that. They've seen that for years. So uh, let this be the wake up call that lets us embrace the biology of our planet and all that it can do for us for good and avoid what it can do for us for bad. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I think I, I agree with you that both of those are such critical and important issues going forward. Um, so I appreciate you uh, bringing them up. And of course, as you said, they both relate to biodiversity and, and the biological world. So uh, trying to make sure that people continue to focus on conservation of biodiversity uh, is absolutely important going forward. Yeah. So bio biological diversity is the ultimate environmental challenge and the ultimate opportunity for humanity. Great. Well, thank Good. you, Tom. Appreciate your time. And uh, we hope that uh, we can work together and make progress on these issues. Happy to make trouble with you anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks. That wraps up this episode of Conservation Conversations. I'm your host, Sean O'Brien. And until next time, Thanks for listening.